How many of you ever saw the, uh, oh, it was a very popular, I think it's a brand. Uh, they had the shirts and shoes and everything. Uh, the words, uh, two, two words on it, no fear. You seen that? You know, no fear is the theme song of an adolescent male, right? You know, it's, it's a, their alternate song is, y'all watch this, you know. Uh, now the southern version of no fear is, ain't scared. And I've seen that also in print, t-shirts and whatever. I want to talk a little bit about fear today. Uh, yeah. Say, preacher, we get enough of that. <laughs> the stock market goes up and the stock market goes down. Washington does things. Uh, the weather changes. Things happen. Lord, uh, preacher, there's so many reasons for fear. Why do you want to talk about fear? Because fear is real. You know, sometimes your fear in a situation is greater than the situation actually is. Matter of fact, sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation that because of the way you respond, you are filled with fear when there is no reason to have fear. Twice in my life I've had coral snakes slither right between my left and right foot. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to die. But of course I realized later on I was wearing shoes. That coral snake couldn't even bite me because his fangs are way in the back. And, uh, but, you know, I was told all my life, you know, red and black on yellow, red on yellow, kills of whatever the saying is, you know. He's got a black nose, it's a coral snake. So that's just a black nose. He's bad. But there's situations where we have fear. I was, I was held up and shot at one time, and I heard the pellets fizzing by. And, and yet, I, afterwards I realized, I'm unscathed. It must be a guardian, guardian angel somewhere that holds it this big because it was a shot. And, uh, but you see, fear sometimes is greater than what we think should be causing us to be afraid. Now, I'm going to talk about good fears and I'm going to talk about bad fears. I want to talk about one particular fear and that at least at, by the time we're done, I want you to have that. But there are other fears that you should not have. Now, I want to go back into the uh, Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bible, turn there to chapter 1. I'm, I'm taking a little brief pause from my series on Christ, the uh, uh, indescribable gift, uh, because I want us to consider the words of the angel, fear not. While you're turning to Luke uh, chapter 1, I want to remind you that in the pages of the English Bible, there are over 360 references, uh, actually 367, where the Bible says, fear not, or do not fear, or don't be afraid. Some English translation of the same basic concept, both Old and New Testament, and it's just important to remember, there's at least one for every, a different one for every day of the year. There are things that we should be afraid of and there are things that we should not be afraid of. And the message of Scripture is that if you will draw near to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you don't have to be afraid. Now it is a natural response, response to be afraid under certain circumstances. And we're going to look at three of those circumstances this morning. Very familiar uh, persons in the uh, Christmas story. I like to call this the, uh, the old priest and the young nobody and, 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 the, and the other nobodies that were doing their job. We're going to look in Luke chapter 1 verse uh, 6. We're going to find a guy by the name of Zacharias. Zacharias is a priest according to the Old Testament uh, law of God, the law of uh, Moses. He is a priest. He is duly appointed. He has studied. He has trained. He's doing his job. He has a necessary function. There was a time when a, uh, a temple and a priest were necessary in order to approach God. Some kind of tabernacle or temple and some person to be the go-between. Even Abraham had a go-between that blessed him and he blessed the, the priest. It was kind of an interesting arrangement. Uh, uh, everyone at that time approached God through the mediator called a priest. And so here in the very beginning of the New Testament, as God is breaking a 400 year silence. Now I'm not saying God wasn't at work. I'm not saying that God didn't speak to people individually. 
If you, uh, you know, Jesus celebrated uh, Hanukkah. It was called the Feast of Dedication, I believe it is. And, uh, you know, God was at work even in those that intertestament period. Uh, these are worthy, days are worthy of, of being uh, celebrated. God was at work, but there is no public declaration of Scripture for 400 years. The time that, uh, yes, sir. Oh, microphone. Microphone, microphone. Somebody give me a microphone. All right. Not that anybody ever wants to hear me. But that's right. But this is a formality, you know. All right. So, God breaks his silence. And this guy, Zacharias, is doing his job. Now, there are so many of the, the tribe of Levi that they had to break up the tasks of the temple and all of the... And there's a lot to do concerning the worship of God. You see, there was... A, somebody had to clean up the place and only the priests were allowed to go into the places that needed to be cleaned up. And uh, somebody had to stoke the fire on the altar. Somebody had to cut the wood to stoke the fire on the altar. Somebody had to carry the ashes away from the altar. And there was more than one kind of an altar. There was a burnt offering altar and then there was an altar of incense and you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. There were guys that had to receive the livestock that were being offered as sacrifices, blood sacrifices, as a covering for the sins of the people. You might say, preacher, that's gory stuff. I don't even like to think about it. Well, I don't either, but I'm telling you it's necessary. Because without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. And so the priesthood was required. It was needful. Way back to Adam, sacrifices were being offered. Abel offered sacrifices to God. Moses and Noah offered sacrifices unto God. Abraham offered sacrifices unto God. Jacob offered sacrifices unto God. And I could go on and on and on. So all these guys had this work to do as people would bring their their lambs and their goats, their bulls, the heifers. And them that were really poor would bring their little turtle doves. And the animal would be slain and his blood would be captured and it would be sprinkled there at the altar. But then, I would say it was a choice job. And by the way, it's a job that everybody should want. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you it's a job that everybody can have. Zacharias had the job of offering incense before the holy place in the temple of God. Say, preacher, we don't even know the formula for that incense. And God, He only likes, you know, Chanel number no. six or whatever it is. You know, he, it's got to be a certain smell. He, you know what? He really did have a prescribed mixture, and we have no idea what it is. But it was, uh, it was offered. Now, you say, Preacher, what incense? I mean, come on. That's, that's not like some people are doing in India. And man, Anna, you're going to see shrines everywhere. People offering incense to some demon somewhere. You know, behind every idol is a demon. Did you know that? Read, uh, was it 1 Corinthians? I believe it is 10. Talks about behind every idol there's a demon. Anyway, in the holy temple of the true and living God. Zacharias had the opportunity to offer incense. Now, I'm going to tell you now how you can offer incense. If you happen to read the book of Hebrews, and if you haven't read it this year, you've still got a couple of weeks left to get it in this year. If you're not reading the Bible through every year, shame on you. Brother Lee, I'm always reminded of the gentleman that you told me that young pastor in, in a place where, you know, he was on the firing line for God, and he was ashamed that he had, he had not read the Bible through once a month, the entire Word of God. And this guy was a praying man too. Can you imagine the time he spent reading the scripture and pray? I bet he read it on his knees while he prayed. <laughs> Amen. That's a great way to pray. You say, I don't know what to pray. Then get down on your knees and open the Bible and just start reading it back to God and you'll find something to pray about. Amen. If you, if you can read the Bible for 20 minutes and not come under conviction, you must be reading somewhere in Numbers. But, uh, but after about 20 minutes, you're going to find something really good. It's going to get to you. It's going to speak to you. Anyway. In the book of Hebrews it says, we've got an altar. We have a sacrifice. And that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. 
You see, his job was to offer the physical incense that required a fire and it smoldered and it smelled real good and it was offered up before God. But even that was symbolic because that was the time that the people were outside praying because the incense they had given was being offered by the priest in their stead and they wanted their prayers to go up with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, incense. And friends, that's what God wants to hear. Do you know that God records prayers? Did you? Anybody? God records prayers. They're, they're written down because they didn't have recording devices back there. And He says they're written down. God he keeps them in memory. Your prayers are important. Ask your wife if you need to tell her I love you at least once a day. And what is the obvious answer? What do you mean just once a day? I've been telling her for 45 years, I love you. Don't you get it? <laughs> she said, well, act like it, honey. But she wants to hear it over and over again. Now, God is not flawed. God is not needy. But God is pleased when we offer our thanksgiving. And it's like an incense that goes up before. Well, Zacharias was doing his job. Now, oh, did I tell you? Zacharias was an old man. Long past Social Security. This guy was probably in his 80s or 90s. And, you know just barely hanging on enough to keep doing his job. Thank God. You know, you young folks, you don't realize that there's going to come a day when you're glad that both your, your, your right and left foot are working. You're just so, so thrilled. They're both working. Amen. And your ears and eyes are both okay at the same time. That's great. That's wonderful. So he's offering incense, and this is what happens. Oh, by the way, he's a good and a righteous man. He's doing everything he knows he's supposed to do for God. He's weak and he's flawed like the rest of us, but he's, he's, he's doing what God has told him to do. And there appeared unto him, verse 11 of, of, of Luke 1, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. May I remind you in the common vernacular, Zacharias, this old man who was doing what he's supposed to do in the place where he was supposed to do it, had an angel pop in and he was scared. What are the next words? But the angel said unto him, Don't be scared, Zacharias. Don't be scared. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Now, I turn on down to Luke. To verse 28. Now, Angel Gabriel's a busy, busy angel right now. Uh, I believe it was Gabriel that appeared before Zacharias. I believe that w this would have been a task worthy of the archangel. By the way, uh, the angel uh, was there to tell Zacharias, Zacharias, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He is going to be great. And Zechariah had his moment of doubt, and he had the opportunity to learn how to overcome his doubt, and we'll, we won't talk about that today. But uh, uh, pretty soon after that, uh, probably about six months later, almost exactly, if we're kind of figuring, you know, he finished his course in the, in the temple, and he went home to his wife, Elizabeth, and uh, she conceived, and they, they had a child later on, six months later. This is what happened in verse 28 when the angel came into uh, the, where Mary was. And, and this is the young nobody. This is a woman from the city of Nazareth. Nazareth is nowhere. It's nowhere. I, I don't have a Georgia equivalent. Uh, in Florida, next to Orlando, was a town called Bithlow. And I mean, it, Bithlow is like Lodibar. It's like... Nothing good comes out of Bithlow. Nothing good comes out of Lodabar. What's a Georgia town like that? Nothing, not Kite. Kite's a good town. The, the, the Lawrences proceed from Kite. But just, you know, that town that everybody picks on. This is where Mary grew up. This is where she was betrothed to Joseph. And he's just a nobody. He's just a plain old working man. I mean, 
they wouldn't be people of name at all. But you see, this same angel, most likely, but at least an angel, an archangel of God, comes to Mary. This time we know his name is Gabriel. And he says, guess what, Mary? No, he says, hail. He says, look up. Pay attention. Big greetings to you from God. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And blessed are you among women. Now Mary would have said, yeah, God is with me. I trust Him and He keeps me every day. And, and people may call me a nobody from nowhere, but I really, I, I'm looking forward to being married to Joseph. They're legally married, but they don't live together yet. They're just betrothed. They're, they're just still treating each other like brother and sister at this point. They're not even probably seeing one another. That would be wise to prevent temptation. So they're keeping the relationship pure, even though they're legally married. And the angel says, The Lord is with you and you're blessed among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying. And she cast in her mind. She was tossing it around in her mind. What this manner of salutation should be. A holy archangel of God has just crossed my threshold and told me that God is blessing me in a special way. What on earth? earth does that mean? Now, maybe in the back of her mind, like every other young Jewish woman, she's thinking, Messiah. You know, every young Jewish woman knew that a woman knew that, that the Messiah was going to be born. And in the, the Old Testament talked about him being born. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government should be upon his shoulders. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Maybe while she was tossing it around in her mind, the thought, oh, Messiah doesn't say. Maybe she thought about it. But it says she was troubled at that saying. And in verse 30, the angel being very perceptive, noticing that the trouble that she was going through was now producing fear. What's the next word? Fear. Not Mary. Now, so far, we've got a good, upstanding, righteous, old, seasoned priest. When the angel comes, he's scared. Now we've got a very young, tender-hearted, pure, virgin woman. And God just, boom, out of nowhere, the angel comes and says, God's blessing you. And she's scared. And the angel says, don't be afraid. Because you found favor with God. By the way, listen to me. Don't you read into that more than there is. You know, sometimes we, we go to extremes with Mary. Sometimes we put her way down. She's just old common nobody. And then other times we say, oh, you know, she's exalted and she's, they make up things about her that are not true. But the angel did say, you found favor with God. By the way, that's the same basic phrase that we find in the Old Testament when it says, and Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But in the English translation of that, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that in the New Testament, that's the only kind of favor you can find in the eyes of the Lord. Because by grace you are saved through faith. We don't have merit. Even our righteousness is like filthy rags. And so if Mary found favor in the sight of the Lord, it was the same reason that you have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because God has given you unmerited favor. Undeserved favor. But she's still scared. Now skip on down to chapter 2 of Luke. <clears throat> now we could talk about the wise men. They came to town and popped in and said, Hey Herod, where's the king of the Jews born? Man, everybody, everybody in town got scared then because they thought, oh no, Herod's going to go on a rant and, and he's going to go on a tear and everybody's going to get hurt. Uh, but we'll, we'll just skip them for now. Let's go out into the field. Now this is uh, nine months later. After the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you are going to have the Messiah. You definitely are going to be the mother of this child. And his father is God. And you're going to call him Emmanuel because he's going to be God with us. And you're also going to name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And you get on down there into Luke chapter 2, some of my favorite words. Sometimes I just recite it for the simple pleasure of it. It says that uh, 
There were in that same country. I had to look at it, get myself started in the middle of the context. There were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping their flocks by night. And guess what happened? Same thing happened to Zacharias. Same thing happened to Mary. The angel of God came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were scared. They were sore afraid. How many of you ever been sore afraid? How many of you ever been so afraid so much that you trembled? You ever been, I have been so afraid I trembled. Whew, man, that adrenaline was pumping and I was just going like that. Whew. Fight or flight. These, these shepherds, these are just common working men. And, you know, they, they are uh, the kind of guys that don't have a whole lot of social skills probably because they have a, a more rural situation. They don't meet so many people. Their social skills are more like close friendships and close working relationships. Kind of like on a farm when you're out and away from everybody and you don't have a lot of near neighbors and you don't have a lot of meetings that you go to and find a lot of people there. Uh, their job was to keep, shepherd, uh, keep the sheep and the sheep liked to go where there was a lot of grass and there wasn't a lot of grass where there were a lot of people. And so they had to take them out in the fields to, to feed them. So there they were, just common everyday folks, and they probably didn't even know how to talk to a priest if he was to come to them. They, they would probably be in awe and reverence. They'd say, man, I'm just an old shepherd. You're a priest. I mean, how am I supposed to address you, sir? Should I bow down? What should I do? An angel of the Lord comes upon them. Now, I want you to notice in the case of all three of these uh, persons or groups of persons that... They're not spoken of as being rascals or troublemakers or thieves. They're not blasphemers. They're not murderers. They're not filthy-minded. They're just human beings, flawed as we are, needy as we are. But they're folks that are trying to do what they're supposed to do. They're people of faith. When you see what the shepherds did after this encounter, you realize, yeah, they were people of faith too. Because they believed the word of the Lord that the angel spoke to them. But in all three cases, when the angel of the Lord showed up, all of them were scared. So my point and my question to you is, since all three reacted in fear, fear of the Lord, is fear a bad thing? Or is fear a good thing? And I must tell you, I don't have a simple blanket answer for that except to say some fears are bad things and some fears are good things. I want you to think about your neighbor. You know why they turn you down when, they, when you invite them to church? Because they hadn't been to church. Of course, the only other cause that people stay away from church is because they have been to church and they had a bad experience. They got extra fear because something came along to reinforce that. Somebody hurt their feelings. Somebody made them feel like they weren't welcome. And that's just, should never be said about the house of God. It's not our house, it's God's house. When Jesus has come unto me, we need to echo that same echo and say, yeah. Jesus wants you to come. I want you to come. We're going to be sending out some postcards uh, real soon about inviting people to our Christmas services. And, and on the, the flip side of the postcard uh, card, it says, We want you here. I'll ask you this question while I'm on that subject. Do you want them here? Do you remember the time when you were the stranger and you walked into church for the first time? Did folks make you to know that they wanted you here. I hope you'll take that to heart. I, I think this, these folks are here in this room are as good at that as anybody, but you know what? We all have room for improvement, don't we? You know, we have different vistas of social skills. We have different levels of kindness and the ability to show it. You know, and the hardest one to show kindness to is to a stranger sometimes because you don't know whether they're packing or not, you know. You don't know whether you want to mess with them or not. But you see, the angel spoke to each one of these folks and said, don't be afraid. And I think God says to us, when he calls us to be ambassadors for Christ, he says, don't be afraid. But preacher, I'm going to India. 
And there are some scary people on the streets of India. Kind of like the streets of downtown Atlanta, the streets of Chicago on the southeast side. Uh, there are some scary people. But the angel of the Lord says, fear not. Fear not. The Bible does say that some fears are bad. Let's talk about them for a moment. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says there is no fear in love, but perfect love runs fear out. It casts out fear because fear has torment. There is a kind of fear that is tormenting. It gets under your skin. It's unnerving. It's debilitating. Did you ever miss an opportunity because you were scared to ask? You know, you wanted... You wanted to shake somebody's hand, but you were afraid to shake their hand. You wanted to get somebody's autograph, but you were afraid to ask for the autograph. I've been stricken with shyness all my life. You say, who? You? I'll tell you, if it wasn't for the enabling grace of God, I would live in a cabin in Alaska right now. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Because uh, I'm basically afraid of people. How many of y'all have been hurt by people? I have too. I'd rather not be hurt by people. I'd rather be left alone. Just me and my closest folks. And I don't know about them sometimes. <clears throat> Some fears have torments. But God says to you, you don't have to be afraid. You know, we, we talked about uh, Jesus being our advocate. And the Bible says, if God be for us, who could possibly be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? We don't have to be afraid. If we could just let God pull back the curtain of our fear and allow us to see how well fixed we are right square in the middle of the palm of the hand of God and would know that he, he, our name is graven in His hand. He loves us. He, he, he's like a mother hen brooding over His little chicks. He's there. He's on task. And He never sleeps. No, not for a moment. Even while Jesus slumbered in the grave, the Father was doing duty on the throne up there in heaven. The Holy Spirit was doing His job. God is on alert 24-7. We don't have to be afraid. And if we learn how to walk by faith, we would not be afraid except for the fears that are good. Now let's finish on the bad fears and then we'll move on to the good ones. The Bible says, He that fears is not made perfect in love. So understand that. If you have a lot of fear, understand this. You have not yet fully discovered how much God loves you. And somebody said, Amen. If you're afraid, and by the way, you know some of the most scared people are the people who think that an offense is the best defense. <laughs> they nervously talk first. Speak first. Because they're afraid to let you speak first. <laughs> Perfect love cast out fear. And once you know the fullness and the depth and the breadth and the height of the love of God, Paul said, nothing could separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Neither past nor present, neither high or low. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That love would cast out all fear. Because fear has torment. Now, this kind of fear is the fear that... Um, we would call it uh, alarm. We would call it fright. We would call it terror. And you know, there are moments when all we have to do is hear the name ISIS. And there's, there's a little bit of, they've accomplished part of their job. They've created terror in the hearts of people. People don't go into regions where there's ISIS strongholds unless they're locked and loaded. So we, 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 we could have a certain fear that maybe uh, is, is hurtful, but then some fears are good for us. You know, there is such a thing as awareness of danger. Brother Billy did me the favor of checking on the, the water heater in the baptistry. We're, 
we're going to try to make sure it gets warmer next time. It didn't warm up like it was supposed to. And, and thank you for putting up with that chilly water. I appreciate your, your, your patience with that. And thank you. Um, you know, when you tear into something that's 240 volts, 250 volts, what is it now? 240? You, you, you have an awareness that there's a particular danger. You click off the switches. You, you, one electrician says, I always put one hand behind my back when I, and I only work with one hand. That way I'm never grounded. He said, that's the theory on it, you know. And so you, there's, there's a kind of fear that gives you an awareness of danger. Uh, when, when you uh, go to open the oven and pull something out that's been in there uh, uh, under a high heat for a long time, you automatically grab you some kind of a mitt or some kind of a thick something because you really do have an awareness of the danger of grabbing that thing barehanded. You've been burnt before. Uh, okay, that's a good kind of fear, but then there's a bad kind of fear that just comes in like a fog. And it just settles in and it soaks into every joint and it just messes with you. And it causes you to fear things that you shouldn't have to fear and fear at times that you shouldn't have to fear. So there are some fears that are bad, but I want to take these last few moments and I want to talk about the three folks. The old priest and the young nobody and the the other nobodies that were just doing their job. That they had a good fear. Now even though the angel of the Lord said, don't be afraid, they had a good fear. And when, before you leave today, I want you to learn that good fear. Now, the reason why some fears are good, I'm going to answer that this way, by telling you the reason some lost, condemned sinners stay that way is because they don't have the good fear. Now, no, stay with me. I'm almost done. But the, this is where it's all going to come together, Lord willing. In Romans chapter 3, it says that the whole human race is lost. There are none righteous. No, not one. There's uh, nobody understands spiritual things. Nobody seeking after God. And it says in verse 18 of chapter 3, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now understand me. If this is a, is a good thing to know, this fear of the Lord, if this is the thing that you need to have before you can be changed from that lost condition, then I want to learn how to have this kind of fear. You see, you see where I'm going with this? Um, we sing the song, It's Beloved, It's Known by So Many. I can just start out anywhere in the middle of it. You know where it is. Twas grace that taught my heart to, to fear. What are you talking about, preacher? The grace of God only does good things. That's right. And the grace of God does this good thing. It did it to this wretched sinner 45 years ago. The grace of God taught my heart to fear God. And guess what happens? When you finally get you a good dose of the fear of God, what does the rest of that verse say? And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. You see, the fear of the Lord is what brings us to the place that we will believe. You know, some people will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ until they get good and desperate. Until something has got them so scared, they say, i got to do something about this. You know, sometimes there's so much ice on the highway, some people pull their cars off and park them and get out of their cars. That's a good fear. It causes them to depart from a situation where they can't get any traction. And there's other situations where a fear will cause you to depart a bad situation. And the fear of the Lord is a good thing. Uh, Zacharias experienced the fear of the Lord because the angel of God stood before him and the presence of God was there with him. Mary felt the fear of the Lord because the angel Gabriel came in and said, you're blessed, you're blessed. And she said, whoa, this is from God. What, what am I, what's going on in the shepherds? Man, when the sky lit up, they said, ha, we're dead. We're just dead. The fear of the Lord. Let me give you a few quotes and I'll be through. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. At the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. You see, when we stop and realize God is not just the man upstairs. God is someone to be reverenced. Three things and I'm through. What is the fear of the Lord? Number one, the fear of the Lord is a fear of offending the great Creator. And I believe that Zacharias was afraid. Have I done something wrong? Did I spill some incense on the floor? Did I fail to do something like I should? Did I bring strange fire? Listen, somebody brought strange fire to burn incense before the Lord and they, whoop, died right on the spot. What did I do? An angel's here to correct me. Oh, no, what's going on? He was afraid of offending God. I believe Mary was too. And I, I, I know the shepherds were. They thought, we didn't order this. <laughs> it's not got our address on it. Did we do something wrong? Are we, are we fixing to be judged? You see, the fear of the Lord in the beginning is a realization God is God. He is deity. He is Lord. He is omnipotent. He's almighty. And I need not offend Him. That's the fear of the Lord. Number two, fear of the Lord is the fear of the punishment that we will receive for our sins. You know, two men on two crosses represented the whole world. Jesus was in the middle. And one on one side was a rejecting world. And the, the man on the other side, he was a man that at some point while his life blood was ebbing out of his body, and while he looked up and saw God incarnate on the cross and finally recognized Him, the fear of the Lord touched his heart. And he said, Oh Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And brother, he got saved. By the fear of the Lord, he departed from evil. He knew he was meeting his reward in seconds. You talk about a last minute conversion. A last minute rescue. By mercy and truth is iniquity purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. The fear of the Lord is the fear of the punishment we will receive for our sin. I've told you many times, the day before I got saved, I saw a movie and it had a hell scene in it. And I did not sleep that night. Oh, I might have dozed off for a minute or two, but all night all I could think of was burning in hell. I'd been reading the Bible for seven or eight months. And I knew that there was such a place. And I was coming to the place that I believed, you know what? Just like I'm hoping that heaven is real, I'm afraid that hell is real. And I realized that I was a sinner and I deserved to be punished. And I want you to know something. By the fear of the Lord, I departed from evil. I went to a meeting that next night and I heard the gospel. And I walked forward and I asked them to tell me how I could get saved. And I called upon Jesus. And Jesus forgave my sin and came into my life and changed me from the inside out. He took away my guilt and shame and filled me with His peace. And it's because I got scared of the punishment that I knew I deserved. Last of all, the fear of the Lord is the fear of what we will be without God. I love Jacob and his wrestling with God. You know, Jacob wrestled with God and he kept on... I mean, you know, he didn't prevail, but he didn't give up. God, you know, just resisted him enough to keep it at a stalemate. You know, God could have pinned him in a second. But, you know, he was just matching Jacob's force. All night long, Jacob stubbornly wrestled with the angel of the Lord. The angelic presence of the Lord. Until finally God said... I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord, Jacob. He reached down there, touched the hollow of his thigh, whoop, went out of joint. Jacob knew clearly, like he'd been learning all his life, that in his own strength, he's a failure. Listen to me. Those next words that Jacob spoke are some of the sweetest. You see, the fear of the Lord is being afraid of what you're going to be without you. Jacob's words were I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me the 
fear of the Lord is saying, I am fixing to latch on to God and I am not going to let go of Him until in Him I find what I need.